<laughs> uh, yeah, like some of this, uh, I, I just um, started doing photometry. Like I, I was really kind of just ah. an uh, astrophotographer, but I, I, I recently uh, decided I'd, I'd take up um, uh, visual observing of variables and then CCD uh, imaging as well. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. So you, I, I, is the actually, goal to I, start doing stuff with AAVSO or something like that? I, I, I joined them, actually. That's where I'm taking the courses from. Oh, great. So that's yeah. cool. And, and, you know, I having watched some of your um, talks on the Internet, I, I, I'm truly inspired now to do those things now because, uh, uh, it, you know, there's a lot more than just what you see. It's, it's like interpreting and, uh, you know, I can see all the challenges that, professionals have in terms of distinguishing signal from noise and all that all that yeah. good stuff mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah so well, well, welcome to our group I, I hope we have a good following tonight um uh, looks like there's uh the usual suspects here but we're not going to be doing any observing tonight <laughs> <laughs> no no uh, well, i don't know what it's been like where you are emily but um the whole the whole west side of the city here is blacked out because we've had um we had a horrendous what rainstorm and then the winds picked up. So the, yeah, they call I mean, it we've the had the same weather down here in Seattle. So yeah. Oh yeah. This, so they, they call the, it the atmospheric the river. This, so this yep. is the car park. <laughs> yeah, that's just down the road from Dave's place. Wow. Yeah, that's, that's the ground river. Park. Oh my god. Yeah. It's Gyro Park. Oh. It's a car park uh, that's used it's probably about two feet of water in the middle of the car park there. And you think how much that, money they wow. spent making it so that wouldn't flood anymore, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> So, that so Emily, like, Emily, just 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 for your understanding, that's not very far from the University of Victoria. It's just kind of over the hill. If, mm -hmm. I don't know if you've ever been to the campus, but uh, I have. I um, I, I don't, I've never been to the campus proper, but I've been up to the uh, DAO. Oh um, yeah, they yeah, had yeah. Me, They had me come give a talk there about five years ago, which was great because my commute up was via float plane. Oh yeah, yeah. That's never, cool. Oh my gosh. Yeah, yeah I've, I've I've done that before too. The other way, I uh, my niece is a is a poet and. Uh, she had a couple of openings down in Seattle at one of the bookstores, so I I just oh, hopped cool. a, I hopped a float plane and surprised her. I kind of hid hid in the corner, and she had no idea I was going to come. So, oh. <laughs> so that last photo was uh, the, what is normally uh, grass with guys kayaking <laughs> on it. Wow, <laughs> we had a whole pile of rain. Yeah, they're supposed to be in the ocean, not on the lawn. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, so Emily, dogs it, run. It, it, Emily, for an astronomer, what are you doing in Seattle? <laughs> <laughs> Getting well, access we... to Apache Point. Yeah. yeah but, oh, so many okay. people ask that. They're, I'll tell them I'm an astronomer and that I'm based here, and I get this look like, is, is that good? Is that where they're going? <laughs> like, should you maybe move to LA? Like, yeah. <laughs> but, you know, if you listen to any of your talks, I mean, we, we don't care who, where we are anymore, right? Not increasingly, no. Yeah. No. I hope I'm not sure which of my talks you've seen. It'll be I'll be sharing some of the same stories. Oh, that's okay. Uh, that's okay. okay. Yeah. <laughs> it's uh, it's great. I, I I love hearing them again. Yeah, it's um, yeah, there's some fascinating stuff. I I, I know you're talking about your book tonight, but uh, but we'd love to have you back again and talk about the the you know that whole compendium of uh, weird star stuff that you you talked. Oh about. yes. Yeah. Oh yeah, and there's some there's some crossover there too for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, I think uh, this is, uh, is is all good. I was, um, I, I, I'll, I'll explain in my intro to you, but uh, I, I came about you in a, in a kind of an odd way. I mean, uh, with the pandemic and such, I mean, I was just kind of looking around for, I don't know, kind of backstories to astronomy, you know, like uh, my, my astronomy is doing kind of cursory. I'm kind of one of these uh, dabblers. And, uh, and then I found your book, so. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's and, <laughs> and I was surprised that there were people there that I recognized, like names I recognized too. Oh yeah. Yeah, Elizabeth. Elizabeth lives in Victoria. Yes, I I got pointed to her for an interview because um, I was at the American Astronomical Society conference, and I just put up a sign, at begging, like saying, "If you have observing stories, come talk to me. I'll be in the back corner of the exhibit hall." And yeah. someone said, "You know, you really need to talk to Elizabeth Griffin." And yeah got and got her to come over and i have an over an hour of her on tape oh, and wow. um i have a 
I was able to use a speech to text API to automatically transcribe a lot of my interviews and hers, she, she, she's soft spoken and the hall we were in was really noisy. So I had to listen to the whole thing and transcribe it by hand. And it was just wonderful. So yeah, yeah. so many interesting stories. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it's kind of goosebump stuff for sure. I mean, I, uh, like all your descriptions of, uh, of the different observatories around the world, I, I, I've only had the privilege of going to, to Kitt Peak in, in the States, but, yeah. uh, but that was an amazing experience, just like you described it. <laughs> yep. No, I mean, that was, that was my first observatory that I got to go to. So, yeah. Okay. So we're just going to probably just wait a few more minutes as people gather. Well, wow, we've already got a crowd tonight. Should I test my slides or they should probably work fine? Uh, but... Yeah, I, I enabled you already, but if you want to just try it, uh, please, please do. Sure. Yeah. Let's see if. Hey, look at that. Looks like that's a nice slide. Yep. See that? Yep. See a giant telescope? Excellent. Yep. 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 <laughs> yep. All right. We like to see a lot of telescopes. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think that I can do. <laughs> OK. <laughs> hey, so Chris, uh, how are we doing here? You, you, did you want to do some kind of administrative stuff first before we start? I think uh, uh, not so much tonight. We've got um, some Edmonton photos to see later. And Lori wanted to say a few words, but uh, other than that, nobody else has uh, contacted me. So, uh, all right. I think we can. Uh, if you want to just give it another, I usually give it about another five more minutes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, also, just to double check, um, you said I should plan to talk for about half an hour, right? Plus Q and A. Uh, you, you know, you know, we thought about it afterwards. That you could you could take the whole show if you want. <laughs> <laughs> Do the full. Yeah. Well, th these have varied from you know kind of around an hour to I think a couple of times we've gone maybe a little over two. So it's just whatever happens. My my guess though, there'll be a lot of questions for you, Emily. So uh, people gotcha. are going to chat with you basically for a good part of it. Do you, okay. I was going to say, do you want me to push closer to forty five minutes? Because I absolutely can. Um, no, feel free to do what what you do. I think I think that's sure. great. I, I've seen a lot of your stuff on on the web, and uh, that's it's an okay length. Gotcha. I was going to say there's variants on. Oh, what yeah, you may I have know. seen where <laughs> different stories go in and out and yeah <laughs> you you don't have to be as short as ted uh but <laughs> i mean perimeter is about the right size that was about an hour right perimeter oh, yeah. institute mm -hmm. yeah yep mm -hmm. yeah so are you are you busy uh teaching classes right now yes um we are in gosh we're in week eight i think i think we're in oh. the eighth week of a 10 week quarter so we have I have a week of class this week and then there's Thanksgiving the week after and then we wrap up with their exam it's oh, a wow. it's a rapid fire yeah it is a rapid fire set of um final classes <laughs> oh, okay I feel a little bit of uh school. sorry <laughs> sorry you're, you're a quarter school yep mm -hmm. yeah, I didn't know that yeah, yeah. yeah. When, when you said test I was starting to feel a little a little nervous there Emily <laughs> yeah they, they they've already started emailing me it's a very it's a very engaged group of students and especially impressive considering how arduous it is to do this mid-pandemic i they've really done an awesome job great that's wonderful are you teaching in person or is it still virtual i am um we went back in person and i think the guidance was that we should plan to have the full quarter in person but especially at the beginning of the quarter, there was this sort of looming specter of COVID saying, you know, we could shut down at any time. And I planned the class so that all my um, lectures are recorded. And students watch the slide, sort of, they see the slides, they hear my voice, and they watch the lecture ahead of time. And then we have in-person class, but it's just a Q&A, where I ask everybody to send in questions ahead of time. I pick a sample. I furiously make slides about an hour before the class starts and then answer those questions and let them spring off to ask me whatever they want. And anecdotally, um, I'd heard about this format of a flipped classroom for years and never tried it. And it seems to be working very well. Scores on the first exam were higher. They get to answer, they get to ask all the sort of funky questions that they might not feel comfortable asking in class and they feel like they would interrupt the lecture. Um, I've been asked about gravitational waves so very many times, and I know we're about to actually get to gravitational waves, and I just keep saying, it's going to be great. You're, we're so close, so. <laughs> <laughs> just wait. <laughs> anybody, anybody is excited about black holes, so. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. 
Okay, well, I think I think we probably can start. So I I, I want to try to just do a kind of a modest introduction to you, Emily. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I want to welcome you to first most uh, welcome you to Astro Cafe. Uh, we meet every Monday night, and uh, we've been doing this on Zoom for uh, all during the pandemic. So we've been doing this for quite a while, but uh, we've had such a wonderful array of uh, speakers, and uh, you're you're no different than that. So. Uh, <laughs> So I'd like to welcome uh, Dr. Emily Levesque uh, to our Astro Cafe this evening. So my first encounter with uh, Emily was uh, through Audible Books. So uh, during the pandemic, I, I found this uh, wonderful book called The Last Stargazers. I guess we're going to hear about that tonight. Um, and I just became totally enchanted with the the, the stories behind the scene of uh, professional astronomers. And uh, I, I just I just love the book. And the, um, the uh, Emily's kind of uh, CV is uh, is kind of astounding. Like she got her bachelor's in um, 2006 from MIT, and she did her PhD at the University of Hawaii in 2010. And um, I think you did a postdoc at um, University of Colorado, right in Boulder. Yes. Uh, and you, you're the recipient of quite a large number of these awards. I, I, I had to look them all up, Emily. You made me look these up. <laughs> and uh, so you, you're 2014 Annie Jump Cannon. So that's a well-known name. And that was from the AAS, uh, uh, the American uh, Astronomical Society. And uh, you, you did that, you got that from your gamma ray bursts, outbursts, I guess. Yes. That's what I read anyways. And, uh, and in 2020, um, you got the uh, Newton Lacey Pierce Award for your work on massive stars and their significance as a cosmological tool. And I've heard mm -hmm. of, I've heard of a lot of uh, that on the web uh, when you were speaking about that. And I, I would just love to get you back another time for that. And uh, you're both um, uh, a 2017 uh, Alfred uh, P. Sloan uh, Research Fellow, as well as a 2019 Cottrell uh, Scholar as well. So you're you're currently teaching. You're an associate professor at the University of Washington, and uh, as I say, you 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 have this interest in interest in massive uh, massive stars and red supergiants, as I understand. So take it away, Emily. All right. Well, thank you so much again for inviting me to come speak tonight. Um, it's great to get the chance to share some of the many stories that are in The Last Stargazers. I'm really glad that you enjoyed them. Um, I will go ahead and share my screen so that everybody can see it. Um, if you have questions, I'm happy to answer them as they come up or at the end. Um, I think people find that generally it works best to hold their questions to the end, but if you wanna jump in right away, absolutely do so. You'll just have to kind of shout to get my attention because the way Zoom does sound, I can't always see if somebody has their hand up or if they put something in the chat. Um, but yes, so what I'll be talking about tonight is my first popular science book, which is The Last Stargazers. And this book is something that I wrote after writing a couple academic textbooks, after spending years in academic publishing, but this was my first foray into the world of trade book publishing and popular book publishing. My book, my ramp up to um, start publishing the book when I was meant to start going to events and getting people excited about these stories of astronomers' lives began in February of 2020. So it was a short ramp up. Um, but one of the events that I did get to go to before um, things started shutting down was a public library association conference in Nashville um, just before the pandemic hit. And that was my first glimpse at the world of book publishing. I got to sit on some panels, meet some other authors. I filled a suitcase with free books. And one question that came up a couple different panels was this idea of how books open, the famous first lines of books. And authors were talking about their book's opening line. They were talking about infamous ones from literature, you know, call me Ishmael, or it was a dark and stormy night, and just the things that stick in people's head. And I started thinking, well, okay, how does my book open? What's the first line of a book that's welcoming people to, you know, the world of professional astronomy and all these adventures that my colleagues and I get to go on to explore the universe? And I realized the opening line of my book is, have you tried turning it off and on again? 
So it's less, you know, sweeping space adventure and a lot more phone call with your internet provider. But this is actually one of the most petrifying things that's ever been said to me at a telescope. Because I was asked this question while sitting here. This is the Subaru Telescope atop Mauna Kea Observatory in Hawaii. It has a primary mirror that's 8.2 meters in diameter. I was using this telescope for my PhD thesis, and as a graduate student in Hawaii, this meant that I had prepared this long detailed proposal for exactly what I wanted to use Subaru for. I'd submitted it to a panel of professors. They'd given me one, you know, precious night of time on this telescope. Amazingly, the weather had been clear. I'd gotten settled at the telescope and started working through my list of observations. I was observing, incidentally, uh, you mentioned my gamma ray burst research, galaxies where gamma ray bursts had gone off. I was interested in the chemistry of these galaxies and trying to see if some quirk of their chemical makeup explained why gamma ray bursts had happened there and not something else. And each galaxy needed hours of time on one of these enormous telescopes. So I was carefully working through my list and then one of the computers in the room suddenly made this awful sort of bloop warning sound. And I remember looking over at the computer and looking back and then looking at the telescope operator who was in the room with me. She was also looking at the computer. She looked a little worried. And then I think in an attempt to reassure me said, oh no, don't worry, it's okay. I think the mirror is still on the telescope. And this wasn't the reassurance I think she hoped for. I didn't know there was an option to not have the mirror still on the telescope. I asked what she meant and she continued first with, "It's if, if it had fallen off, we'd have heard the crash, which, Yes, but she explained to me what she thought was wrong. The Subaru telescope is configured much like a lot of the other telescopes that we're all familiar with. It's got the primary mirror sitting at the base of, in this photo, Palomar sort of standing in as a stunt double, but it's got the uh, primary mirror sitting low and then the secondary mirror suspended high above the primary overhead. What that Blunk had told us was that the mechanical supports supporting that secondary mirror had failed. They were no longer effectively holding the mirror up. We had gotten lucky with how the telescope was positioned and the telescope was sitting sort of straight up and down. So the mirror was being held on by gravity. But if we tipped too far to one side or the other, we risked dumping the secondary off the side of the telescope, which would mean it would plummet about 70 feet and hit the concrete floor. And that's if we were lucky. If it, we were unlucky, it would hit the primary mirror on the way down. And for a sense of scale for the primary mirror, this is me standing beneath a different telescope, the Gemini telescope, but one with about the same size mirror, you know, 27 feet from end to end. So this was the mirror that I was at risk of breaking, which is a pretty monstrous amount of bad luck. We put in this very nervous call to the day crew that operated the telescope and made sure that everything on the engineering side went according to plan. And they told us, oh yeah, we, we probably know what that alarm is. It's probably just a false alert. You can probably just fix the problem by turning the telescope off and on again. And the amount of probably in this explanation was not reassuring. And it seemed really impolite to say, you know, this is a telescope the size of a building. It's not my modem in my house. I'm not sure that power cycling it is the problem solving solution I'm looking for. And sitting there, I was now tasked with deciding what to do. I was 24 years old. I was a graduate student. I really wanted this to just be a false alarm that we could fix with the flip of a switch to keep observing. But I also didn't want to be the grad student who killed Subaru. And I had just stories spinning through my mind that I'd heard from my colleagues over the years of epic ways that telescopes had failed. The one that I kept remembering the most was of this telescope. So this is the Green Bank Radio Telescope in West Virginia, or rather this was the Green Bank Radio Telescope in West Virginia. Because in 1970, in the midst of some observations, this telescope very quickly went from this to this. It suffered a catastrophic collapse. And at the time, I didn't remember exactly what had gone wrong to cause this, but I was pretty sure that a grad student had tried turning it off and on again. So I was a bit hesitant to try this at one of the biggest pieces of glass in the world. So I sat at Subaru trying to decide whether to give up precious telescope time for my thesis or soldier on, hope it was a false alarm and risk destroying one of the biggest telescopes in the world. I could not possibly figure out what to do. And this is the story that actually opens my book because it gives people a starting behind the scenes look 
at what it's actually like to be an astronomer, what the stakes are like working at these telescopes, how surprisingly tense trying to stay awake all night can sometimes be, and these incredible strange choices that we have to make about the beautiful but delicate instruments we work with and the scientific questions we're trying to answer. These sort of background stories are the things that I really wanted to share in the book because it's really not hard to sell people on space. Everybody loves these kinds of pictures, you know, the beautiful nebulae, galaxies, star clusters. They love the pictures that the Hubble Space Telescope sends back all the time. They make them, you know, the backgrounds on their phones. We see them printed on clothes. These are very popular and people love the sort of beauty and majesty of space. But very few people know the stories behind these pictures and know what astronomers actually do, what our job entails beyond admiring pictures like this. If you ask someone to picture an astronomer, they generally picture something like this. They'll draw a photo or they'll give you a stock photo of a man who seems to always have a beard and is wearing a lab coat for unclear reasons and is standing next to a little backyard telescope on a tripod and peering through it with his eye. It's a completely fair mental picture to have because this is the stargazing that most people are familiar with. Maybe they got to go to an astronomy club open house night or do a little bit of stargazing in a neighbor's yard or get just the chance to peek into a telescope sitting on a sidewalk somewhere. They just sort of imagine that grown into a professional scale job. The reality of our jobs is very different, but it's not surprising that people wouldn't necessarily know this because out of a planet of seven and a half billion people, only about 50,000 of us are professional astronomers. So our stories are not readily available to be heard. I was certainly a kid who wanted to know what an astronomer did all day because I knew I was interested in space from a really young age. Uh, this is me at six, proudly sporting my brand new Hubble Space Telescope t-shirt. Hubble had launched that year and I, my brother describes the look on my face in this series of photos as, what do you mean six-year-olds can't use Hubble? I was all in on becoming an astronomer, becoming a scientist, and getting a chance to study the universe, I did get the chance to get a little bit of backyard stargazing experience. Uh, this is me and my dad in our backyard with our little um, Celestron telescope. But I didn't really know what my job as a scientist would entail. I knew I wanted to be a scientist because I wanted to spend all day thinking about space and answering questions about the universe. But I wasn't really sure what I'd actually do. I didn't know any scientists. I didn't know any PhDs. I wasn't near a university where I could learn what this job is like. Most of my picture of the job of a scientist came from the movies that came out while I was growing up. And based on this sampling, uh, based on Twister and Jurassic Park, certainly, I got the sense that if you were a scientist, you spent a lot of time getting chased by your research subjects. Um, Contact was a wonderful movie and an even better book. Um, but I knew even as a kid that you probably didn't discover aliens every day as an astronomer. So I would need to learn a little bit more about what the job entailed. I didn't really get a good glimpse of professional astronomy until I visited Kitt Peak Observatory. And I went to Kitt Peak after my sophomore year of college as a research summer student working with Dr. Phil Massey, who is an astronomer at Lowell Observatory in Arizona, on studying how really massive stars die. The start of my project involved going to Kitt Peak and observing for five nights on one of these telescopes. And it was my first time at a professional mountain. So we got up to the mountain, we dropped our stuff off in the dorm, and we wandered over to the cafeteria for dinner. And when we walked in, there was a whole group of other astronomers sitting down and eating. And Phil sat us down and introduced me, saying, this is Emily, she's a new summer student. She's never, this is her first observing night. She's never been to an observatory before. And everybody at the table started going, oh, that's great, that's so cool. Like, re remember to drink some coffee so you can stay awake, but don't drink coffee too late because then you'll never get the chance to fall asleep. And then someone else explained, you know, remember to order your night lunch. So the little extra meal the cafeteria makes astronomers to eat in the middle of the night. Order your night lunch, but try to not eat it until about 1 a.m. Everybody eats it way too early. And then someone else chimed in with, you know, while you're sitting at the telescope, keep an eye on the floor. We have scorpions here. And one woman had a scorpion crawl up the inside of her pant leg and sting her, which is true. And then someone else said, well, that's nothing. I know a guy who was observing and he had a raccoon tug on his pant leg because it wanted some of his cookies. And then someone else said, well, I know someone who was observing in a telescope when it was struck by lightning. And these stories went pinging back and 
forth. And I remember sitting there with my fork, you know, practically stuck on the way to my mouth going, I don't know if I just want to sit here all night and listen to stories or if I want to run off to the telescope and start building up some stories of my own. And it took me a little while looking back on this memory to kind of realize what that storytelling had been. This was people's way of kind of welcoming me to the field. These stories that astronomers tell each other are a way of sort of preserving the very unusual quirks of our job and of sharing what our jobs entail. So years later, thinking about this as my introduction to what astronomers actually do all day or all night is what I use to build The Last Stargazers. So the book is meant to give people this behind the scenes peek through storytelling and through a narrative of what astronomers actually do, of what life is actually like as a professional scientist in this field. The book has happily been nominated for several awards and been a finalist for a number of science book awards um, for both adult reading and books that are suitable for young adults. So if you have any young people in your life who would be interested in a story like this for Christmas, this book would be a great thing for them to get a look at. Um, you can learn more about it at the website or at the um, hashtag that I'll use on Twitter when I'm sharing news about the book. So to write the book, I got to go on some great adventures of my own. I got to visit observatories all over the world and get wonderful behind the scenes views of places like gravitational wave observatories and historical observatories. But my favorite part of this whole process was actually the picture on the lower right here. And it looks underwhelming, but that's a picture of my trusty little voice recorder. Um, this is what I used to interview my colleagues. I spoke to more than a hundred fellow astronomers for this book. And from those interviews, I built the stories that make up a lot of what's now in The Last Stargazers. Now, I'm not a trained investigative journalist. I'm not a trained interviewer. It was a wonderful exercise in learning how to interview people and how to encourage people to tell their stories. And I learned that a lot of this involves just putting people in the driver's seat and letting them talk and letting them tell you what they want to tell you. I mainly just wanted to gather people's most memorable stories, but there were a few questions that I asked everybody. There were a handful of questions that I knew I wanted to get answers to because this would help form the background and the narrative arc of the book. The first question that I loved asking people was what their most memorable secondhand, not quite true story was. Plenty of people told me about things that had happened to them, but I was specifically curious about stories that had been passed around the field so much that they'd taken on a life of their own. So stories that had kind of entered the legend of the field and they would tell it to me with something like, this totally isn't true, but someone once said, or I heard that this happened once, do you know anything about that? I, I wanted those stories that had just stuck in the field's memory. There were a couple versions of stories that kept coming up over and over again with this question, but a single story was probably the most commonly referenced. Almost everybody that I asked this question to gave me some version of, do you have the one about the telescope that got shot? Everybody had some memory or some half-built version of this tale in their heads. And there is truth to this story. There is indeed a telescope that got shot. And it's the poor telescope in the picture here. It's the 107 inch telescope at McDonald Observatory in Texas. When you ask people where the shooting came from and how the whole story came about, they have all sorts of invented tales in their head. They imagine, you know, a grad student mad at their advisor. They imagine this dramatic tale of a spurned lover or some like festering scientific disagreement that came to a head. It was none of these things. It was an unfortunately disturbed and inebriated member of the observatory staff who in the middle of an evening became hell bent on destroying the mirror of this 107 inch telescope. He had a handgun and ran up to the telescope, walked into the control room, pointed the handgun at the telescope's operator. Unfortunately, nobody was injured in this. And he then demanded that the telescope be lowered so that he could peer down its barrel from the secondary down to the primary and destroy the mirror. The operator lowered the mirror, the gunman pointed his gun into the telescope and he emptied the gun's clip into the mirror. And it sounds tragic, but you need to think about just how enormous telescope mirrors are. This mirror is 107 inches from end to end, and it's made out of thick borosilicate glass. This is the same kind of glass that's in your Pyrex dish at home. So imagine a foot and a half thick Pyrex dish, and then imagine trying to 
stick a bullet into it. The bullets basically went thunk and landed and embedded themselves in the glass like darts in a dartboard. So this was the end result. You didn't get a dramatic shattering of the mirror. You got a few bullet holes and an otherwise unperturbed piece of glass. The gunman was disappointed in this result. He then tried to go after the mirror with a hammer instead of the gun and toss the gun aside. At that point, he was subdued and taken away, and the observatory staff sort of peeked their heads in to assess the damage. Now, when they looked at this, they thought, you know, this isn't that bad. We can probably come back from this. They realized that they could dig out the bullets, paint over those holes with black paint so that you wouldn't get light reflecting around inside the telescope. And as they saw, the 107 inch had really just become 106 inch and they were fine. Unfortunately, this was not the word that got out to the community because all the community heard was, guess what, a telescope got shot. And the rumor started to percolate that this telescope, which was pretty new at the time, had been irrevocably destroyed. It got to the point where the observatory director actually had to release a statement via an astronomer's telegram. Now, normally these are used to say things like, oh, we discovered a new nova that somebody should really go look at, or we have ongoing monitoring of this variable star, and here's a little bit of new photometry. And this was, it had to be one of the most unusual bulletins like this ever put out, where he explained the incident, but then reassured people, you know, the harm suffered from the bullets was extraordinarily small, which really, it has to be one of the best sentences that's ever been put into an astronomy bulletin, and it has now lent my book one of its chapter titles. So this is a wacky story about something strange that happened in an observatory. I actually also like it as an example of why you have to understand the science of astronomy in order to really understand the drama of the story. For example, you need to understand why we call a telescope like this the 107 inch. You need to know that those big primary mirrors on telescopes are the most precious piece of a telescope. The size of the mirror dictates how far you can see and the quality of your image. So it's so important that it literally winds up being synonymous with the telescope's name. You also need to understand what a telescope operator does. He pointed a gun at a telescope operator in order to get the telescope lowered. A lot of people might think that professional astronomers run their own telescope, so this is a whole job that lots of folks don't even know exists. You'd need to understand just how big and beefy that mirror is to know why the bullets didn't shatter the glass. And you need to understand how rare professional grade telescopes are. It, is destroying one telescope that big a deal? Do we have dozens of telescopes like this? Hundreds? Are there only a handful like it in the world? Without that context, the story doesn't make quite as much sense. So I have this story in the book, but it comes about halfway through. It comes after this context and story sort of explaining to you what life is like at an observatory have already been presented so that the full impact of it and absurdity of it, it must be said, kind of lands when somebody reads it. Another type of story that a lot of people brought up to me was some variation on the quote you see at the top. They'll say something like, well, there were these weird bursts of radio light and somebody detected them and they, they thought they were space and then they wound up being something. What, what were those things? And they would half remember the story of somebody picking up a false detection and accidentally pick, describing something very pedestrian as something from the mysteries of the universe. Most people were referring to this story, which happened at Parkes Observatory in Australia. So this is Australia's beautiful big radio telescope. And this telescope back in 2007 detected a very strange, brief, but bright burst of radio emission. Nobody knew what this was. It didn't fit with any theories predicting how you should detect radio emission from space, this sort of brief blast like this. It puzzled everybody and it was sort of set aside as an oddity of the telescope. Years later, another astronomer named Emily Petroff showed up at Parkes Observatory as a graduate student, and she wanted to study this event and others like it. She wanted to study what the sky looked like in radio light and what it would be like to see little, what these little bursts of radio emission could possibly be. And when she explained this project idea, she was discouraged by folks at the observatory. They said, oh no, since that first one, we've been detecting these all the time. We're pretty sure that these aren't anything real. We think we must just be picking up some weird interference from the ground. 
This happens a lot with radio telescopes because they're sensitive to radio wavelengths. We can't see radio light with our eyes, but if we could, if all of you could just sort of turn on radio eyes and look around the room around you, you'd see just a mess of light and signals. You'd probably see your Wi-Fi network coming through the air. If there's cars driving by on the street, you'd see little flashes of light from the lightning bolts in the sky, in the, uh, the car's um, engines, spark plugs, will actually give off radio light. You might see a little murmur from a microwave oven in your kitchen. You might see signs of a fluorescent light or a cell phone going off. So we produce a lot of excess radio light right here on Earth, and telescopes can sometimes be fooled. They all assumed that that was what explained all of these bursts. They had even given them a name. They called them peritons. This is a Greek um, this is a myth mythological figure that looks like one thing but casts the shadow of something else. It's, you know, we think this is real science, but it's probably just some interference from the ground. Emily Petroff wanted to get to the bottom of this and explain where peritons were actually coming from in the hopes that you could maybe distinguish ground-based interference from a truly interesting scientific phenomenon. And she wound up rounding up the whole staff of the observatory to take part in this research. When she ultimately published a paper on what she found, it's the only paper, I believe, from Parks that has all of the staff members, so the administrative staff, the cleaning staff, everyone, as an author, because everyone took part in the survey. And their first hint as to what could possibly be making peritons came when they realized that they clustered around the lunchtime hour. So, the universe is a mysterious place, but the universe does not care when lunchtime is in Australia. So, this was their first clue. If you look at a sort of aerial shot of Parks Observatory, you can see these three administrative buildings marked with arrows. They all have office space, they all have break rooms. Those break rooms all have microwaves where people would heat up their leftovers to have some lunch. And they eyed the microwaves going, oh, that, that sounds like a pretty good culprit for the signal that we're seeing. And they started testing these microwaves to see if they could make a periton. In the research paper, it's wonderful to read this part of the work because they describe everything about how these microwaves work. Some poor soul read like an entire 1970s manual on how microwaves work. They described running them on different levels of power. They ran them for different durations. They always just microwaved a ceramic mug full of water. They tried everything. But they couldn't make the microwaves make a periton. These weren't producing the radio interference that they thought they were supposed to see, and they were really getting puzzled. And finally, someone realized, you know, they were doing this experiment like really careful scientists. They were putting the mug in the microwave, closing it, entering 10 seconds, patiently waiting. Then once the microwave was done, they would remove the mug and go check the data. And this isn't how we all microwave food. When you microwave popcorn or your dinner, you get it in the microwave, you stand there watching it because you're hungry, and as it counts down, you see it going three, two, close enough. And you open the microwave door, you know you do it, just before it stops running. When they tried this, when they used the opening of the door to stop the microwave from running, rather than waiting until the cycle completed, they did it. They were able to produce a periton. So when they went back to their archive of data, they realized that they could clear out all of these weird bursts of radio light that they detected, except for the one from 2007. That burst could not be explained by the pattern and signature of an errant early opened microwave. That was a real burst of radio emission coming from a distant galaxy. These are now a whole class of astronomical objects known as fast radio bursts. We have archives of dozens, hundreds of these bursts. We're trying to figure out where they come from. We think they might come from dying stars, but we're not certain. We're seeing if we can use these to study the structure of the universe, to study distant galaxies. So these are now a whole scientific field, but they came from determining first that they were not microwaves. That was the key first step to then moving on to the science of figuring out what they are. People loved telling me stories like this. The Accidentally detected microwave was probably the most famous, but people had many, many others. My favorite one that I heard fairly recently actually happened at another radio observatory. This is the Green Bank Observatory in West Virginia. I showed you the picture of the sadly collapsed telescope earlier. Uh, this is the new beautiful replacement telescope in all of its glory. And this observatory is built in the United States' National Radio Quiet Zone. So, this part of the country 
is specifically designated as an area where radio interference should be kept to a minimum. If you have a microwave there, it goes in a special Faraday cage. If you want Wi-Fi, you're out of luck. There's no Wi-Fi in the area, no cell phones. The vehicles that drive around the observatory actually run on diesel power so that they don't have spark plugs and don't generate radio interference. They're so, so careful about not producing radio interference. They're also in the middle of this beautiful remote state forest. And in that state forest, there's a lot of wonderful opportunities to do natural research. There was a research team there that really wanted to study the forest's population of little flying squirrels. They wanted to study these cute little squirrels' behavior and habits and migration patterns. And the best way to do this was to capture a bunch of squirrels and then tag them with radio collars. So they wound up producing a fleet of adorable sources of radio interference and then unleashing them upon the observatory. And to hear the observatory tell it, they basically had to stop doing research for a few months because all they detected was squirrels. They would try to observe, you know, the black hole at the center of the galaxy, squirrels. They would try to get some radio observations or radar research on a nearby planet or moon, squirrels. They just had to shut down and do engineering work until the batteries and the little collars died. Another version of this actually takes place at a gravitational wave observatory. And this is surprising to a lot of people because you tend to assume that these sorts of mistaken identity cases in astronomy could only happen from interference from light. Um, but LIGO is no exception to this. So this is the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Waves Observatory here in Hanford, Washington. It's this exceptionally engineered, just beautifully designed experiment that consists of two long arms built at perfect right angles to one another. In each arm is a perfect vacuum and bouncing up and down those arms are lasers reflected off of very heavy mirrors, which they call test masses. This observatory is built to be robust to any tiny little perturbation that could happen in the area that could move the mirrors. The idea is that if the observatory stays very still, it can detect the motion of one of those mirrors from a gravitational wave passing through Earth. So this is a density wave in the fabric of space-time that would slightly squeeze and stretch one arm and then the other of the observatory. And that tiny change, that tiny bit of motion, would be picked up as a gravitational wave coming from a distant collision of two black holes or two neutron stars. The LIGO observatories have been able to detect gravitational waves for decades since they were first being built, but the problem for a long time was that they also detected everything else. They would detect earthquakes, they would detect rain hitting the ground, they would detect trucks driving by on the highway miles away, they could detect the, the smack of waves hitting the shore 200 miles to the west at the Pacific Ocean. So they had to build these to be perfectly robust against any tiny perturbation from anywhere else in the area. They mostly managed this, but they eventually got foiled for a little while by a raven. So what happened here is that the ravens in the area around Hanford, come summertime, saw LIGO not as a, you know, beautiful observatory, but as a really great place to get a little bit of a drink on a hot day. Those pipes, those vacuum pipes are cooled with liquid um, nitrogen, and the liquid nitrogen pipes would build up ice. And the ravens realized that they could peck at the ice and get a little bit of a drink. The observatory staff started seeing these very strange signals in the data and wondering, you know, what in the world is causing this? We've built this observatory so beautifully that it is sensitive to rain hitting the ground. What could possibly be causing this? Somebody wandered out, looked at the ice, saw suspicious looking peck marks from ravens having poked at the ice. They then caught a raven in the act. It's not really a good scientific experiment until it's reproducible. So with this, that meant sending out a grad student with a hammer to mimic a crow, mimic a raven and test the hypothesis. And they wound up figuring out that, nope, they weren't maybe detecting the first real signal from somewhere else. They were detecting a raven trying to get at some ice. They shielded the ice and probably fixed it so that it, you wouldn't get as much condensation and the raven problem disappeared, but it was yet another case of mistaken identity in our data. So those were people's favorite stories to tell me. The telescope getting shot and then all of these versions of, oh, have you heard the one about the telescope that thought it detected something and wound up detecting something else? 
Another question that I liked asking everybody was what they thought would surprise readers of the book the most about our jobs. What's the biggest disconnect between what astronomers actually do and what people think that we do? And a lot of the answers fell into the category of we just have a lot more adventures than people think. I think there is this picture of astronomers just sort of sitting next to a telescope or standing next to a little telescope in their backyard or just waiting for something to happen in the sky. And as all of you know, you can really have some adventures trying to get to a dark sky site, trying to get your telescope working, trying to get the data or the snippet of time that you want to catch as you're observing. And people had wild stories about all the amazing lengths that they went to in order to get their data. By the way, I promised that astronomers, professional astronomers, weren't guys in white lab coats standing next to little telescopes. The man on the lower right is breaking my promise, but he has a good reason and I'll get to it because that is one of the coolest telescopes that we've ever built. The best adventure that I got to go on for the book and for my own research that fit with these tales of just how far we go to do our research happened here at the Stratospheric Observatory for Infrared Astronomy, or SOFIA. So SOFIA is a NASA experimental plane that has a telescope mounted in its rear chamber so that it can peer out of what you see as the open back door of the plane while it's in flight. This is a specially modified Boeing 747. It flies higher than commercial aircraft fly. It can open the door in mid-flight. It does it so smoothly you can't even feel when it's opening. And because it does this, it can observe wavelengths that we normally can't get at from the ground. From the ground, infrared light is largely blocked from our view by all of the water vapor in our atmosphere absorbing it. By flying up to the stratosphere, we get above 95% of the planet's water vapor, so we get this beautiful clear view of the sky that you would otherwise only be able to achieve by going to space. I got the chance to fly aboard Sophia as part of my research for the book and as part of my academic research. I was interested in using Sophia to study the infrared light from dying stars to see if we could get a glimpse at how these stars shed their outer layers right before they explode as supernovae. I got to go down to Christchurch, New Zealand, fly on this plane as it flew down almost to Antarctica. We got so close to the South Pole that we were able to see the southern lights out the window of the plane, which is one of the coolest things I've ever seen in my life. I tell this story in the book because it is for sure one of the biggest adventures I've ever gotten to go on in my research. I think if you had told little six-year-old me with the Hubble t-shirt that I would be in an experimental aircraft flying over Antarctica looking at the southern lights while a telescope plane pointed at a star I told it to point to, I would have been pretty excited. In addition to just jumping up into the stratosphere, we'll also really go to every end of our own planet. We will launch things like experimental balloons or suborbital rockets to carry instruments high into Earth's atmosphere so that we can detect infrared light, ultraviolet light, gamma rays, things we really can't get from the ground. And the whole act of designing an experiment putting all your effort into this beautiful telescope and then sending it aloft on a balloon and hoping nothing goes wrong. It's its whole own version of astronomy adventures that I didn't learn about until I started writing this book. I talked to colleagues who specialize in studying uh, solar eclipses and who will bring all of their research equipment with them and chase eclipses all over the planet. This particular picture is from a solar eclipse in Svalbard, Norway in 2015. It's taken at that beautiful moment of totality, but right next to this photographer are team members taking scientific observations of the sun's corona, trying to get this brief glimpse of data of how the sun's wind works, how the sun's magnetic field works, what the corona is made out of and the composition of it. These eclipses are the only time when these astronomers can take this data, so they'll chase them and bring all their equipment with them to every little corner of the planet where you can catch a moment of totality in pursuit of their research. I talked to astronomers who had wintered over at the South Pole. I was lucky enough to fly over the edge of Antarctica. These folks actually got to go stay at Amundsen Scott Station near the South Pole itself to work at the South Pole Telescope. They told me amazing stories of what it's like to winter over there or to do research there and live there. They've literally at this point gone to the ends of the earth for their research. So I promised I would explain this man on the lower right. 
This is George Carruthers, and he is the inventor of the ultraviolet camera. So he's invented the technology that we now have on telescopes like Hubble that are capable of taking good ultraviolet pictures of the universe. He's standing next to a telescope that he designed and built using his ultraviolet camera. And this telescope is the only telescope we have ever taken to the moon. This telescope was brought to the moon on board Apollo 16. Astronauts John Young and Charlie Duke operated this telescope for several days, and they got the first ever ultraviolet pictures of our own planet, of stars in the Milky Way. They got to see what the aurora looked like on our planet in the ultraviolet. It was our first chance to sort of open ultraviolet eyes onto the universe. When I wrote The Last Stargazers, I realized that I had to kind of bracket what types of stories I was telling or else the book would be a thousand pages long. And I decided, you know what, I'm going to stick to ground-based astronomy. I'm not going to write about Hubble, about Spitzer, about our beautiful space telescopes, simply because they're different types of stories in a different book. This seems like a space telescope, but I maintain that it counts as a ground-based telescope. It's on some ground. The ground just happens to be the lunar surface, but it was operated by John Young and Charlie Duke, just like so many of us operate our wonderful little backyard telescopes. I think the best adventure story that I wound up hearing about the things that can happen to people while they observe actually happened pretty local to where we all are in the state of Washington. So this is Manastash Ridge Observatory. It's a little observatory in South Central Washington State. It's owned by the University of Washington, and it's used as a teaching telescope for our undergraduates. It's for a long time been used as a potential research telescope for graduate students. And a graduate student at the University of Washington had one of the more harrowing observing adventures that I heard at this telescope. The astronomer was Doug Geisler. He was using this telescope for the first night of his PhD thesis. Um, thinking about my Subaru run, I'm starting to wonder if PhD observations are a little bit cursed. He got through his first night of observations at Manastash Ridge in 1980. And as was the fashion at the time, he took very careful notes of how the night had gone in the observatory's night log. So you can look at his notes. He says, oh, I didn't lose any hours to bad weather or clouds or anything like that. Hours lost zero. Sky condition, excellent. You can see his notes saying there were clouds, but they cleared off at sunset. Beautiful night, great seeing. Went great, went to bed at 5 a.m. This is a perfect, excellent night log of a successful observing night. So when I tell the story in most places, nobody knows what's coming. But if I tell the story in the Pacific Northwest, especially in Washington and Oregon, somebody looks at that date and goes, oh, I know what's coming. So he went to bed early on the morning of May 18th, 1980. He woke up around noon. He was expecting to see, you know, sunlight peeking through the cracks of his curtains. He was expecting to open the door out onto a beautiful sunny day, just like the one you see in the picture, to get ready for a night of observing. He opened the door into an ocean of just blackness. He could not see his hand in front of his face. He grabbed a flashlight, pointed it into the ash, and it was swallowed up within about 10 feet. It took him turning on the radio to figure out what had happened, but he was sitting in the midst of the volcanic plume from Mount St. Helens. Mount St. Helens had erupted earlier that morning to the southwest of the observatory. And a very unusual thing about this volcano's eruption is that the side of the mountain basically blew off. So the plume of the eruption traveled to the northeast. And you can see what this winds up meaning for Doug here. You can watch the eruption of the volcano and then you can see where Doug and Manastash Ridge are. This had completely swallowed up whatever he could see from the summit at Manastash Ridge. He realized what had happened when he caught a radio report. He ran out to the telescope and covered it because he knew that volcanic ash can be corrosive and could have potentially damaged the mirror. And he then wrote one of the more epic night log entries that we have in astronomy. Hours lost, six, reason, volcano, good excuse, huh? Sky condition, black and smelly. He very carefully documented what it was like to be there while a volcano had erupted not too far away. Fortunately, the telescope was fine. He was fine. He was able to get home safely. But it's, I agree with him, one of the best excuses for losing a night of observing that I think any of us have ever seen. 
this log entry lent my book another one of its title chapters. So chapter four of the book is now titled Hours Lost Six, Reason Volcano, looking at some of the many natural ways that the Earth can kind of mess with our plans to observe the universe. You can also see the familiar title of chapter five right below it. So the last question that I asked people was how astronomy had changed since they began observing. And this question tended to have the same answer from almost everybody. Everybody pointed to the changing technology of astronomical observing. For decades, people observed using photographic plates. And these were wonderful tools for capturing astronomical images, despite how sort of complicated that they were, they were to work. People would order plates from a company like Kodak that would arrive um, treated with a silver nitrate emulsion on one side that would darken when it was exposed to light. Astronomers would take these plates and do all sorts of things to them to make them as sensitive to light as possible. They would bake them, they would freeze them, they would flash light at them very quickly. They would rub lemon juice on them. One guy swore by bathing them in ammonia. Um, there was a team that would briefly bathe infrared plates in hydrogen gas, and they did this in a specially designed area that didn't have any sparks in the light switches that was very fireproof. It still got the nickname Hindenburg Hallway, but everybody swore that this was the best way to make a photographic plate work. Astronomers would chemically treat these plates, they would slice them down to a size that would fit into a telescope's camera, they would then try to load the plates in, and they would do all this work in the dark because once you expose the plate to light, it would start to darken. Even in spite of all of this effort, they would have to sit at the telescope for the entire night once the plate was loaded in, loading in and unloading plates as they pointed to different galaxies or stars or nebulae or whatever it is they were observing. And at the end of the night, they would take the plates away, develop them for hours, and then exhausted look at what they had to see if they had gotten good data. They often did, though, get amazing data. You can see this old photographic plate of the galaxy NGC 6946. This is one of my favorite galaxies because it's hosted 10 supernovae in the last 100 years. It's an absolute record by galactic standards. And you can see the spiral arms. You can see signs of the dust lanes. You can see maybe clusters of star formation. It's a beautiful view of this galaxy. People that I interviewed who had used photographic plates for observing fondly told me tales of their adventures of observing, but nobody missed the plates. Nobody wanted to go back to using this technology because they would compare what a photographic plate image looks like here with an image like this. So this is the same galaxy now imaged with Subaru, the same telescope I was talking about at the very beginning of this talk. With this digital camera imaging that we now have, you can see the just exquisite detail of this galaxy. You can see every sign of a dust lane, every knot of star formation, every beautiful curving spiral arm. It's just a stunning view of how a galaxy like this would work. So the technological changes have been amazing for our science. They've also been really interesting for how we do our jobs and where astronomers actually belong in the process of observing. As part of my research, I got to visit this telescope, the Vera Rubin Observatory in Chile. So this observatory is under construction. It's going to start observing in about a year and a half. It's named after the woman who discovered dark matter, and it set itself a high but reachable bar for the kinds of discoveries that it should be capable of. It is going to photograph almost the entire southern sky every few nights over and over again for a decade. It's basically going to give us a movie of the southern sky. We'll be able to see every tiny thing that changes in the sky. We'll be able to see an asteroid scooting across from frame to frame. We'll see variable stars brightening and dimming. We'll see a supernova appear and then fade away. So this observatory is going to revolutionize how we study what we call time domain astronomy, or things that change in the night sky with time. But what it can't necessarily do is identify something strange and then follow it up, or identify some weird type of star, and then get a spectrum of it, or ask follow-up questions. I'm so excited for this observatory to come online, but at the same time, I'm excited to keep using it in concert with a lot of the other telescopes that I've talked about in this lecture. I'm really excited to use it with enormous telescopes like 
the Gemini telescopes or the Subaru telescope, the big glass telescope that I mentioned right at the beginning of the talk. At telescopes like this, sometimes we still get to go sit at the telescope ourselves. Um, increasingly with the pandemic, we operate them remotely, but we still have an astronomer controlling what the telescope points at. We need telescopes like Green Bank, um, radio telescopes, things that observe at very different wavelengths. We need telescopes like SOFIA that are capable of getting wavelengths that we can't normally reach from the ground using these really creative means of scooting up a little bit closer to space itself, getting above enough of the atmosphere that we can get a different part of the spectrum. We need all of these in combination with Rubin and in combination with our full set of observational capabilities if we're really going to keep answering the questions that we have and the qu new questions that we'll be getting about what is going on in the night sky. So on that note, I'll leave up my book's information again. Thank you again so much for inviting me to speak tonight. I'm happy to answer whatever questions you might have. Thank you so much. That's excellent, uh, uh, Emily. Um, maybe uh, if people, um, I'm just going to switch to as soon as Emily uh, switches off the share, uh, maybe people can just uh, raise their hands and uh, if they wanna ask a question or use one of the reactions on the Zoom and uh, go ahead and any questions. Uh, Peter. Hi everybody. Emily, that was really fantastic. Your, your ability to tell an anecdote is as good as the anecdotes themselves. and. And, and, and I'm really glad actually that you're doing this because I've all, I've believed for years that the exciting anecdotes are, you know, something that's really underappreciated in astronomy. So um, I don't, I'm, I'm not going to tell, I'm not going to ask you a question uh, unless I phrase it as a question, like it was like it was a Jeopardy game or something. Do you know the story <laughs> of how the Green Bank telescope was funded? Um, the new one? Yes. <laughs> okay then the senator then I do the senator, Ro the senator robert um i don't know enough of it to tell in detail but it is the senator robert bird telescope um i remember learning of the political machina machinations that went into gaining funding to rebuild it um the original telescope had been just the 300 foot telescope it was immense it was amazing and then it collapsed because i think they figured out that a support gusset plate had been engineered just a shade too thin um and then the lobbying came in to rebuild um nobody wanted to waste this amazing dark sky, um radio dark site and robert bird of west virginia really lobbied to make sure that this rebuilt telescope would be funded and it is now the hundred meter telescope i believe yeah um so I, I'm, I'm sure that there is a more, I know that there is a more dramatic political tale there that I don't recall at the time, but the backstory of it being funded is its whole own event. Um, there's a wonderful book that talks about pre-bird um, observing at Green Bank that's titled, But It Was Fun. So baked right into the title, you can see the attitude of, and then it collapsed. But yeah, it's it's a it's an interesting site. So they, 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 they wanted to, you know, rebuild the telescope, of course, like you say, the site was really quite impressive. And, you know, they, they were afraid to ask for a lot of money, because mm -hmm. they just knew it would be tough. But, you know, Bird being from West Virginia, they thought that would be a pretty good idea. And they wrote a proposal to him. And, you know, they, they had been talking about maybe spending $50 million. And they thought it would be really <laughs> tough to get $50 million from Congress. So they were hoping to build a 100 meter telescope, but they were really having trouble figuring out how they could, you know, pay for a 100 meter telescope with only $50 million. So they wrote up a proposal and they sent it to Bird's office. And in the proposal, like the first line, the opening line said, you know, we want to build a 100 M telescope. <laughs> Bird came back screaming at them and said, you crazy idiots. You said you only wanted $50 million. The best <laughs> I can do is, best I can get you is $75 million. <laughs> And that's how the 100 meter telescope got funded. To, to, which, to which the appropriate response is, well, I suppose that'll be enough. Okay. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. 
<laughs> what were they uh, planning on naming that? Was it like the extremely large telescope? Oh, it's the Robert C. Byrd telescope now. Oh, but, um, <laughs> um, he paid for I, it. <laughs> that, I have to imagine that was the first line. But um, a lot of these telescopes will have working titles. Um, the James Webb telescope used to just be the next generation space telescope. Um, we have a telescope going up soon called um, the Nancy Grace Roman Observatory, and it, they all have very boring acronyms. Uh, my favorite one, though, is a conceptual telescope for a hundred meter that I think it's like, named like the outlandishly large telescope or the owl. So we <laughs> we really love bad acronyms in astronomy. <laughs> uh, Dave, uh, you have a question. Yes, excellent talk, Emily. That was that was great. That was fantastic. <laughs> so simple question. Why the title, The Last Stargazers? Yeah, um, I've had a lot of my colleagues ask me this because it sounds depressing. It sounds like it could be a sort of heartbreaking book. And it it is a little bit of a challenge that we don't want to see the last generation of stargazers come anytime soon. We're not necessarily at risk of that. Record numbers of people are applying to undergraduate and graduate programs in astronomy. And people are very enthusiastic and passionate about space. We want to keep the night sky in a state where we can have further generations of stargazers. We don't want, for example, excessive satellite pollution. We don't want excessive light pollution. We want to make sure that sort of the human curiosity driving research still stays, even as we start automating astronomy more and more. Um, it's also a bit of a reference to the shift in how we do our jobs. I mentioned that we used to, you know, order photographic plates from Kodak and slice them up in the dark and climb into a telescope. And we don't do that anymore. We very much do still stargaze, but that type of observing is an era that we're kind of not getting back. And the book is meant to preserve these really unusual stories from a very small but fascinating field and to kind of memorialize those last tales, even as we keep doing astronomy in other ways. Uh, Gary, you have a question. Uh, yes, Emily, excellent presentation. Thanks so much. Your enthusiasm at six years old was fabulous. I have a question <laughs> for you. I've just been introduced to this 12 year old that has exactly the same sort of enthusiasm as you and, it's, and her parents who are artists have said, can you please help us with this young lady who loves anything mechanical? I'm scared to death, Emily, about just squashing her enthusiasm. Could we communicate offline maybe about how to not screw this up? And have you got any recommendation, recommended resources? Oh, yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd be happy to chat more. And, and anybody who's curious about this sort of thing, um, remind, remind me that we met here. Yeah. And I'm happy to talk about that. But I'd say that in general, um, when I was the really enthusiastic 12 year old, who knew I wanted to be a scientist, but I had no idea what that meant, who was getting picked on at school because nobody else was into science and I was the weird nerdy kid who wanted to read about the Apollo program and not go to ballet. Um, I mostly just wanted to know that there were other people out there like me. I wanted to know there were other kids who were this into science. Um, I got the wonderful opportunity to go to some summer enrichment programs that were just perfect for this sort of thing. Um, and I liked reading stories about people who were like me. Um, when I was writing my book, I remember thinking that I would have enjoyed reading some of these stories as a kid. And I had books like that that I used as a reference. Um, there's a classic book by Andrew Chaikin called A Man on the Moon that tells the story of how the Apollo program happened. And I read that book feeling like I was reading about my friends and I was reading about a bunch of men who were engineers and astronauts in the 1960s, but it didn't matter. Their enthusiasm felt familiar to me. So showing them that there are other kids like them, there are other people who love this sort of thing, that they aren't, they aren't going to be the only person interested in this, and that there's kind of a community and other people and their stories waiting for them is, is always so encouraging. So your book would be appropriate for this girl to read? I didn't, I didn't mean to turn it into a sales pitch for the book, absolutely not. But yes, it's, it's, a, it's appropriate for young adults. Um, and other things like this too. I mean, there's lots of wonderful books being written about astronomy right now, about the life of astronomers, about the science of it. Um, if she's interested in, you know, the end of the universe or she's interested in life on other planets, there's great books out there on that right now. Um, and then, yeah, any opportunity to do a science fair with a group of people, a summer program, anything to connect with 
other people and get um, any chance for her to enjoy being a scientist already is always perfect. <laughs> very good, a very good line, very good line. Okay, good, thank you so much. Uh, any more questions for Emily? I, I, I actually have a question, Emily. Um, so just to talk about um, young people and people uh, uh, starting in astronomy today, um, how do you feel about that now? I mean, you're teaching undergrads. Um, what, what do you think of this next generation? I mean, it's it's so fantastic to see people coming in so enthusiastic with so many new ideas. Um, I actually love when my students give me, and they'll feel embarrassed about it, but when they give me really off the wall ideas, like why can't we build a telescope between here and Mars? Why can't we put one radio telescope here and one radio telescope on Mars? and make a telescope that big. And when they start learning about the technical limitations that we have right now, they think, oh, that was stupid. Of course we can't do that. And those are the ideas that we want. Somebody years and years ago said, why don't we put a telescope in space? The somebody was Lyman Spitzer. He wrote a paper about what became Hubble decades before we had even successfully put something like that into orbit. And you need these sort of wacky, you know, why can't we do that ideas? So I love hearing this from them. Um, I think the only thing that makes me nervous might not be quite the right word, but I desperately want to see us have enough funding to support students like this. Like I said, there's about 50,000 professional astronomers in the world. And the amount of funding available from the National Science Foundation from NASA is as good as those organizations can make it. But I'm always amazed by just thinking, you know, we could we could double the amount of money that the National Science Foundation gives out to astronomy research every year, and we'd still have funded less than half of the research projects that we all have ideas for every year. And those projects are what fund graduate students or what fund research students are what keep the field going. So even a little bit more money would wind up going so far and with so many excited people coming in and so many big projects coming up like the Rubin Observatory and its big survey, we're going to need these folks and we're going to need a way to support them and help them make this their career because we've got people eager to do it. We just, we need to be there for them. Great. Great. Thank you for your comment. Yeah. Uh, so is there anybody else that wants to comment or I, 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 I'm flabbergasted. It's just such a wonderful talk. <laughs> um, Thank you. And, and I really, um, I really enjoy the book as well. And uh, I'm looking forward to future books from you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, let me just check to see if there's any more questions. Okay, I don't really see any here. Hey. But, uh, oh, oh, yes. Um, I, I'm curious, Emily, you never said uh, whether you know, uh, you cycled the power on the Subaru telescope. <laughs> <laughs> I, th I think I think the appropriate answer here is you'll have to read the book, oh. um, but <laughs> but I can reassure you the Subaru telescope still in one piece. Excellent. I, my, so much. my career was not ended by being the grad student who killed Subaru. So yeah. So, so so Emily, there are many IT people in this crowd, so we appreciate the comment. <laughs> and it re I will say, much as the comment sounds funny, it's amazing how much power cycling or just hitting something once can fix so many problems. <laughs> I'm sure all the engineers here will say that too. Yeah, I was a practicing electrical engineer for something like 50 years. And how often you tell them, uh, I'm first check the plug yep. it, and then is it plugged turn it in? off and on. <laughs> yep. a, um, a common difficulty in astronomy and a reason why we need more young people in the field is we need people to build the next generation of telescopes and the next generation of instruments. And that takes this really amazing cross section of skills of engineering and astronomy. And for those of us like me who are not engineers, the magic that goes into building an instrument is this sort of like, we sort of look at it with this sort of slightly nervous, slightly reverent amazement. Um, and you see this preserved in some really funny ways in instrument documentation. Um, I had one friend tell me a story of a imager that had worked for decades at Palomar Observatory. And there was a note on it saying, do not touch this switch. It's saying we had to do some stuff a while back, like we kind of glued it together, but this switch has to stay in the on position. If you're messing with things, if you're turning them on and off, do whatever you want, do not ever world ending touch this switch and at some point they were retiring the instrument and took it apart and the switch was connected to nothing <laughs> it 
<laughs> it wasn't, it, it, there was nothing running to it. So, but people had carefully, carefully followed this policy for years using this instrument. So there were multiple stories along those lines of the secret magic button you push that suddenly makes everything work. And the astronomers mostly go, I just want to be able to observe. So they're fine with flicking the switch three times and spinning around and spitting and then getting to the observatory. But yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Okay, well, uh, if there's no more questions, uh, thank you again, Emily. Uh, you're more than, uh, uh, you feel free to <laughs> remain with us for a little while or um, go to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I unfortunately do have to get running, but thank you again so much for inviting me to speak. It was great to get the chance to meet all of you. And yeah, I hope, I hope everybody has a good rest of your week. <laughs> yeah, I hope, hope to have you back again. Good night Definitely. and thank yeah. you. Bye -bye. Good night. Bye. Yes, so, thank you. So, so Chris, did you uh, did you want to take over the rest of this? Sure. Thanks so much, David, for uh, hosting Emily. That was uh, that went very well. Um, yeah. So we have um, some um, photos from um, Edmonton. If uh, if we're ready, there, Dave. Yep. Ready to go. If I can get oh. this working again. There we are. So this is from Abder Anwar again. Uh, it was a photograph taken on the 9th. And it's very hard to see in this, but there's this very faint ghost-like nebula called LBN 438 in Lacerda. Um, and to tell you uh, how faint that thing is, its surface brightness is magnitude 23. <laughs> he got it with two and a half hours of data. He says it might take me a few weeks to get another 10 hours or so, but it looks like it will be interesting image. Um, but then somebody pointed out, if you look at the far bottom right of so that, that is, image, right? the friend in that image is a 12th magnitude galaxy, UGC 12137. Uh, and it has a very low surface brightness, of course, as well. But uh, it's amazing if you have patience and time and a good instrument, the kind of stuff you can find. Uh, it would be interesting to see if he gets some more definition in that nebula when he finally gets some more data. And then the next one, you did get the image for it. I did? Yeah, he was, he was curious about why the Nova cast looks pink. Uh, and he, he, so he, he said he, he, uh, he'd used a, a, a DSLR and took this, this image. Uh, and he was wondering if the actual color of that nebula is, is what it looks like, which is pink. And uh, Warren Finley replied that Nova spectra are dominated by Balmer lines. So he's assuming the pink color is due to an H alpha emission mixed with the companion stars Nova emission. So pink, pink Nova. <laughs> Pretty cool. And then the last one, I think it is, is, is Tom Owen. This is IC410 in Origa. He took that on November the 12th on a Friday evening. Three hours and six minutes, three hours worth of six minute exposures before the clouds came. He's got a Ta Takahashi FS102 with a reducer using a QSI camera. And H alpha was eight at six minutes. Uh, O3 was seven at six minutes and S2, 13 at six minutes for a total of 108 minutes. Uh, and he's it, processed it using Astro Pixel processor and a few other odds and sods. Use star tools to uh, emphasize the stars. Um, it's the colors, he says, they're, they're H alpha, O3 and S2 are on the, the Hubble palette. So that's what we're looking at here. And then to make it really interesting, Luca Vanzella commented a very nice image of the nice, a nice 3D look at, at it, especially on my phone. And besides, besides that, the tadpoles, and you can see those little squiggly blue things there. You also got the tadpoles, but you also got what he called goatee goat face in the nebula. <laughs> and of course, he says, once you see it, you can't unsee it. <laughs> Yeah. So quite an interesting nebula. 
So that's the three from Edmonton. And it's unlikely they're going to be getting any this week because they got forecast for some heavy snow. <laughs> yeah, I guess this muck is heading their way, is it? Kind of? Yeah, it is. <laughs> yeah, my my uh, my daughter said they were getting some snow today in Edmonton. All right. Great. Well, thank you for uh, sending those or getting those for us. That was great. Um, Lori, you wanted to tell us about um, some items we have for sale and a star party this coming weekend. Yes, that's right. Hi, everybody. Um, I had gone ahead and um, um, ordered some calendars, uh, the RISC calendars, and they are not here yet, um, but I get they, they have been um, ordered and uh, they are sure that they will come before Christmas, which is the most important thing, of course. Um, and I wanted to um, make sure that everybody who wanted um, a calendar would be able to get one. Um, I had started a list of, um, of some uh, of the people who wanted uh, wanted them, and I do have I do have the names of a few, but I just wanted to make sure that um, that people that had put their name down, um, I had already gotten I had already gotten some. So I think maybe the best thing to do would be to um, either uh, to probably um, email me at um, uh, Roche dot lori l a u r i at gmail dot com and give me a uh, give me a list i think um also uh, deb was deb put something in um in a um uh, an email as well and i was i got barb uh, barb and kurt's um number from from her but i just wanted just to make sure that everybody had a chance to um to ask for one that wanted one we also i also received um, five of the almanacs, the, the 2022 almanacs that were that were uh, done, and I have some of those here, and I also have two each of the workbooks for the Explore the Universe and Explore the Moon. Um, so those those are the um, where inside there's all the information that you need, the lists of what you need, and then some of the pages in order to get yourself going to it. Anybody that's fairly new into the um, into the organization or have not done it before, they might be really good. And I just decided that it's um it would be easier it would be easier if we just had some in uh, had some uh, if people needed them, uh, they could just simply um, could ask for them. So those are uh, those are there. We have not received the invoice yet for everything that with all the with with all the. Um, the amounts of money, so we aren't exactly sure, but we think, um, Chris, I think we said that the that the um, calendars would be sixteen dollars. <throat> I think <clears throat> to put put them up a little bit, and that the um, that the uh, uh, almanacs would be probably um, in in about that same range, and the workbooks would be at about the twelve dollar range, something like that. Uh, we're not making any money out of these. We're just going to just make sure that we that we cover our costs. Uh, yeah, but just, it's much cheaper than if you decided to try to find to get one from from it. You'd find that you're paying more. In fact, in a couple of cases, more for the shipping than you are for the actual the actual object. So it's easier if everything is just simply done through through us. Yeah, that's the that's the outstanding item at the moment. Is how much does the shipping cost? So we just don't want the center to lose. <laughs> we don't want to not lose money. subsidize right, the that's right. but, uh, so yeah that's why we're we're not quite 100 percent sure what they'll cost but thank you laurie for coordinating that i did not have um access to the ras.ca site with my personal account i think because right. i have i have access to the membership thing so somehow they had trouble getting the two working anyways but uh, well they uh, actually, it, was, it was a it was a, a phone call and saying, sure, what do you want? And I just gave her all the information and it was done. So it didn't take, yeah. take very long at all. That's good, thank you. You're muted again. There we go, and uh, Saturday. Can I share my screen? Yes. Please. Okay, let's see if I can have this working. Okay, um, so, um, I'm just going to just give you a little uh, a little thing on on this coming Saturday. 
um, we are going to be having a first of two star parties that are going to be uh, with, uh, uh, with and about the James Webb Space Telescope. And we're part of an organ of, of a group of people from all over everywhere um, uh, that is that are called community events for the James Webb Space Telescope. So that um, different different groups in um, in different communities um, all over uh, the the U.S., Canada, Mexico, um, Chile are all simply taking some time, and the and people are are um, volunteering to speak on behalf of the James Webb Telescope at these community events. So our first one is this coming Saturday from seven to nine thirty. Basically, our same our same star party that we're used to having. And what we're really trying to do is show Canada's role in the exploration of the, um, uh, in the, using, the using the James Webb a Space Telescope. Um, some of you may have already um, heard Natalie Wallet last Tuesday, I believe it was, that started off the program at the R, with the RASC. Um, and, uh, and ours is just going to be one that, because we're out West and we have a couple of people um, on at the DAO who's working on it, um, they were, are going to be helping us out. So Dr. Chris Willett is going to be our first speaker for the evening, um, and he's going to be talking about the Space Telescope and how it's how uh, how it is ready to launch. Some of the work that's gone on in um, getting it ready to launch, uh, the complete delays that have been that have been um, you know for about 15 years, um, and some of the work. But Chris works up at the DAO and um, is part of, is actually one of the principal investigators um, for two of the cycle, the, the cycle one research projects that are going to be done. So he's going to talk a little bit about that. And then the next one is Matt Taylor. And I, I believe we've, we've had Matt Taylor Matt within the past couple of years, but he's going to be speaking again about his, um, again, his cycle one research project that he's doing on black holes and, uh, and how, uh, like where they are, how they're hidden behind in, in kind of things. He's doing some work at, uh, at looking into something very specific about bl uh, massive black holes. And he's gonna be talking about how that, how that works for us. So uh, we're going to be having for the schedule starting at seven o'clock, um, Don Moffat will be doing a what's up in the sky. And of course the night before the, uh, on Friday night is the lunar eclipse. And we're hoping that possibly there help, will have been some um, uh, some uh, some clear clear enough skies that maybe we might have something with that. Our two presenters between seven twenty and then eight forty. We're giving uh, those are just kind of uh, basic times. We're giving enough time for them to be able to speak and then have some questions afterwards. And then we have um, uh, Ruhi. Ajam Hamid from the from UVic, who uh, worked with this oh gosh several times in the uh, in, within the past year to do to help with the ask an astronomer and then from nine to nine thirty uh, David Lee and some of the people that we are very fond of that uh, that our work with EAA are going to be uh, finishing off the evening um, I believe and maybe if somebody's on that knows a little bit more that there's still some problems with the camera on the Plaskett telescope. Um, and so we're probably not going to be using the Plaskett, even if it was a gorgeous night. Um, I don't think that at this point, we're going to be opening it um, at that point. Um, and then we are having, a, there's two ways in which you can, can do this. Um, there's a, this is the web, this is, a, this is the meeting um, uh, and anybody, anybody can join the meeting. Um, no, there's no, reservations there's no it doesn't you have you know, have to be a member of this or that or whatever it's, a, it's an open invitation um, for anybody to join the meeting and with that zoom um, link or you can actually watch it on our youtube channel as well um, this uh, this is uh, if you kind of if you went to it right now it would just say you know coming soon or something like it said it'll be but it, this will be where it will be on uh, youtube um, at seven o'clock as well so I'm hoping that you are all invited. We hope that you will that you will come along to uh, part of the part of the evening. This is, as I said, our first one that we're going to have. Uh, the second one is on launch day on December the 18th, um, and uh, so we will. The launch is in the morning, 
but then we will be having two more speakers um, uh, in, in the evening. And, uh, and both of them again are, they are, they are uh, volunteers from the James Webb Space Telescope um, looking at, um, at helping out community events to, um, to keep some of the work going here. So please join us. We hope that, uh, we hope that you will. And if uh, this, this uh, Zoom is on our events page, uh, we'll make sure, Chris, that you get it up so that it'll be on the, it'll be um, on your uh, Saturday, <laughs> your Saturday newsletter that goes out. Um, and, uh, and you can, and you can pass this around to some of your friends um, or your neighbors, something like that to be able for everybody to be able to see it. So thanks everybody. Great. And it was, um, if you're looking for the link to, if you received the weekly um, RASC email, it was in there this morning. Yes. Yes, we had that. We had, we, we had it in the RASC and, and uh, then the next one, the next one for the 18th of December will be in, uh, will be in the next, the next one as well. So this one specifically is for this coming, this coming Saturday. Very good. Thank you. <clears throat> Does anybody else have anything for this evening? Yeah, just one last comment about the partial lunar. Um, it does start on Thursday night, mm -hmm. uh, probably yeah. around 10, and it goes on into the morning. Um, the last I looked at the weather, it, it actually looks promising. I don't know if Reg wants to comment on that, if Reg, Reg is still around. Uh, when is this? Uh... It's, a, it's Thursday evening around 10 uh, to about 4 in the morning. And I think maximum eclipse is around 1. 102s, yeah. something uh, like that. I, uh, my, my opinion is that uh, cl cloud is going to invade early uh, uh, Wednesday morning and we're going to be back into uh, oh, okay. uh, a cloudy oh, okay. pattern. Too bad. Yeah. Well, you never know. <laughs> yeah, you just, you just don't, right? This time of the year, it's, uh, yeah, it's looking kind of iffy, but you never know. And I think Simon Gage... We'll rely on Gary to go out and take some pictures. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have some we'll have some live feed on it. So yeah. might have to I might have to go there. Um, I can show sorry, do I cut somebody off? Yeah, I can show the the uh, simulation of it if people want to see that. Um, Sure. And while you're getting that ready, I just uh, mentioned too, I believe there's a Makers SIG meeting on Thursday. I don't know if there are any other SIGs. Yeah, there is. There is. Uh, I think the Astro is next week, I think. Right. And here is what should happen. So it would be a beautiful apparition if we could see it um, on that day. So uh, 10 p.m. is roughly when it starts. 1 a.m. is when it is at maximum. So this is 10, this is 11, this is 12 midnight going into the 19th. One is maximum and two, three, and 4 a.m. is when it would pretty well be gone. Uh, uh, Joe, would, Joe, 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 at maximum, Joe, I think I think it's pretty well covered. It, it's not that partial a partial. Yeah, people call it a partial, but really not. I mean, it's it's um, oh, ninety seven percent. Yeah, yeah, it's quite quite a bit. It's yeah. it's a it's a it's a total as far as I'm concerned. Visually, it would look as a look as as much as a total as anything. Mm -hmm. yeah. But it, it might be interesting. It might just leave, leave that just little sliver, so it might be a good photo op. Never know. And it's in between the Hyades and the Pleiades. Yes. Yeah, it's so, so it'd it be might, so pretty uh, photographically, yeah. it'd be lovely, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's a good photogenic spot for it to be in. So. <laughs> and it'd be pretty high for us too, right? So. Yeah, it, that's the other good thing about it. It is at maximum, the, the, you know, the altitude is, um, um, yeah, 50, 55, 57 degrees. So nice and high. Pretty good, yeah. Great. Right. Yeah. Chris, could I share the screen for a second, please? Sure, please. Um, was that Thursday that the... Um, yeah, Thursday uh, night, Friday morning, right? 
Yeah. Yeah. Th Thursday. Thursday night around ten, starting around. Yeah. 10. Well, this is ten a.m. on Thursday. Um, uh, that's that's hopeful. <laughs> the, uh, at uh, four p.m. Vancouver Island is right here. A low pressure system's off the Oregon coast, and uh, 10 p.m. is there. So uh, read it and weep. That's all oh well. Wow. <laughs> this would be the time to look like being on the north end of the island might be better. <laughs> those rare times. But, I think Arizona looks a lot better. Yeah, probably. Gary, Gary will have to. Gary will have to give us a live feed. <laughs> we're, we're relying on. No pressure. <laughs> <laughs> um, does anybody else have anything for this evening? Oh, Chris, um, yeah. I just one thing. Uh, uh, Nathan Helner and, and Mastelman and uh, I are going to be on the Global Star Party tomorrow night. That uh, is uh, that is going to be. On is Nathan still on here? Yes, he is. Yeah, I'm okay. here. Hey, Nathan. Um, Hi. And so, like, starting at about four thirty our time in the afternoon, um, uh, we're going to be we're we've been invited to be part of this global star party. So Nathan is going to be talking about some of his wonderful comics and his uh, his nerd anomaly and some of his photographs, and then we're going going to open up the uh, the uh, DAO for a virtual tour and tell people and there's going to be all kinds of different groups on from Chile and Mexico and um, the United States and everything is going to be on the global star party um, tomorrow night so um, I don't uh, Nathan do you have the do you have the um, the link yeah maybe throw I it do. into throw it into the chat maybe okay Sure. Yeah, but then people might want me. People might want to just. It, it's a. It starts at around four o'clock our time. Do, do you have to register? Oh wait, no. I have the link for people who are. Oh, who are giving but not the not not the. Hmm. Not to go in. I don't. I don't think I have. have a, uh, link? I don't think I have like the web URL. Right. I just have a That's Zoom it. link, and I, and I only have the other one as well. So it, it's called. It's called Global Star Party. Oh yeah, yeah, well I'm pretty sure you could find it. It's called Global Star Party 73 Falling yes. Stars. Yes. Yeah. So anyway, that's just oh. Okay, well, thank you for letting us know about that. Because uh, yeah. I don't think that was out there anywhere. Um oh, no. great. Um, anybody else? Okay, so um, thanks again, David, for arranging our guest. Oh, no problem. That yep. was uh, really good. Were yeah, she has, she has quite a number of videos on the internet. So check out her Weirdest Stars uh, video. It's it's quite good, too. Marl, did you have a question? Yes, yeah, so I just wanted to ask if we're not going to be able to see it live with the weather. Um, is there a good space um, observatory that we can just check into in the night? Like we usually, like Goddard or somebody that... I know there's been times we can sit and watch them during the night right. where they can see it. I wonder I wonder if SLU is gonna do anything. Joe, do you do you know? Have you heard if SLU is doing anything? I really don't know uh, what they're up to. I I don't know that they're terribly well equipped for something like an eclipse, but uh, okay. <laughs> I just it's been fun if you could go and watch different ones during the night. Yeah. yeah. Well, if we if we find anything, I guess we can get Chris uh, to push it out. Uh, Peter yeah, that... posted a link in the uh, in the uh, chat. Oh, okay. I see. Okay. Cal Good. Organized or uh, organized event, I guess. Okay, I'll, add, I'll add that. I'll add that to tonight's notes, so you have a link to work from. Okay. Yeah. So Thank if, you. Uh, yeah, and if anything comes up in time. Um, Maybe let Joe know because uh, he can post it with the uh, the notes that he puts together for the uh, uh, after each uh, video is prepared. Oh, and thank you, thanks, you know, Peter, for those. You need to say thank you, Joe, for doing that every week too. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I know the people, who, especially the people who don't come in person, will appreciate uh, do appreciate seeing that. Yeah, it's available. It helps. 
<laughs> um, just a reminder that we do have um, Dr. Robert Thursk uh, coming up as a speaker uh, next month. Um, that won't be recorded, um, but we are looking to expand. So there, but to invite other people to that. So there may be a bigger crowd at that evening. So we'll see how, how that goes. We'll try a bigger event. And that's on December 13th. Um, John will be hosting next week. So uh, I'll, uh, when I send out the information, uh, if you've got something to share next week, please contact John. And reminder, a few SIGs this week. And um, Randy, for those on council, I think Randy was planning the council meeting for next Tuesday, week tomorrow. So I think that's it for this evening. So thank you again for, for attending. Thanks for people who presented. And in absentia, thank you, Emily, for a really fascinating uh, presentation and a, a book for my uh, Christmas wish list. So I'll let her know. I'll send her an email. Yeah, that was great. Yeah, David's uh, idea of uh, listening to the Audible book is a good one. Um, yeah. They're they're usually uh, less expensive as well. Right. Yeah, I, I I really like it actually. Yeah. And it's good to see Gary. You made it successfully to the south. <laughs> yes, indeed. We arrived last Friday, and I, in a world record pace, I got my scope running tonight. And discovered it's way out of collimation. Darn it! I was hoping it would actually be perfect, but it's not. Yeah. There it goes. <laughs> kind of like raising Frankenstein, you know? Something you can do tomorrow. <laughs> right. I'll send pictures. Yeah. Very good. Well, thanks again, everyone. And uh, yeah, have a great week. Good night. Good night. Thank you, David. Thank you, You're David. Welcome. Thank you, Bye -bye. Chris.